I get to take the early teens to the zoo today, and they say it's going to be a wee bit warm, a wee bit warm, so I'm getting ready, so I'm getting ready. And also the fun run this morning. Last year, I was, uh, I, I was the first over 50 person to finish, okay? I, I finished fifth, although Dean Carlisle could have easily jumped ahead and beat me. Um, <laughs> And, and I've been boasting about it for a year. Now, I know a few of you might be over 50. So I want you to come out at 8.30, right, Holmes Lake, and, and see if you can take my title, okay? See if you can, see if you can, uh, hopefully Ron doesn't show up because he probably will beat me. Um, but see if you can take my title and finish in, I think I did it in about 28 minutes last year. You're impressed, aren't you? You had no idea I could run like that. But welcome. So good. Chris, you can come down. You're not over 50, but you can come and challenge me. You're 44? You don't look 44. You look incredibly young. That's a good job. A good job. That Adventist lifestyle, it keeps us young, doesn't it? It keeps us young. One of, one of my friends, well, not my friends, one of my brothers was telling me when I went back to England, I look mighty young. How do you, how do you keep so young? And uh, I told him it was a Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle. And he didn't believe me. He thought I was joking, thought I was messing around. And uh, I told him, I said, listen, if you would just drink water like you drink beer, you would look like me. But he didn't listen. <laughs> and so I'll pray for him. Well, welcome. I want to take you back to England when I was a, a young lad. In fact, when I was about 18 in 1984. And it was the summer of 1984, and I was laying on the sofa watching cricket. It was a lazy Sunday afternoon with not a whole lot going on, just lounging around watching cricket back home. And my mother came into the room, and she had my little brother. And I remember that it was the summer of 1984 well because it was his birthday. It was August 1984. And my mother came into the room and said, we are going into town. We're doing a little bit of shopping, and then we're bringing Simon's friends back for a party. And I thought that was a hint not to touch anything, not to mess the house up or do anything. But then she added something else. She said, there is a trifle in the refrigerator. A trifle in the refrigerator. You will get some later. Don't touch it now. Now, if she hadn't have come in and told me those words, I wouldn't have got into trouble that day because I was very comfortable on the sofa watching cricket. But I remember her walking down the garden pathway with my little brother. It was a very cute scene. They were holding hands. And I remember going up to the window and watching them walk all the way down the road. And then they turned left. And the moment they turned left, you pause a little while to make sure. And the moment they turned left, I went back to the refrigerator, opened it up. And there it was, forbidden fruit. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to get some later. I shouldn't mess with this right now. I'm going to get some later. Shut the fridge, went back, sat down, continued watching cricket. But I kept thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And boy, and on a hot summer's day, a trifle sounds so good. You see, you don't have trifles over here. At least you don't have very many. But I, I, I'll describe a trifle for you. A trifle is a, fr a, 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 a three-layered dessert, and on the bottom was something like you, you would call jello with a sponge cake and whatever fruit trifle you're going to make, and then there's a blancmange again of whatever trifle flavor you have. There's a blancmange, kind of like a thick custard, delicious. On top is fresh cream, and then covered in whatever fruit the trifle is. And this trifle was a strawberry trifle. I remember it well. So strawberries in the jello, strawberry blancmange, fresh cream, strawberries covered all over the top. And I looked at that trifle, and I looked at that trifle, and I looked at that trifle. And for a little while, I thought of my little brother, not for very long. 
and this was his precious day. And then I just jumped in and I helped myself to some. Just got that spoon down and made sure I got all three layers in. Went back, sat in front of the telly, carried on watching. But you know what? It didn't taste so good. And the reason it didn't taste so good, it, although it was a very good trifle, was that I knew that I was going to get in trouble. I knew that I was going to pay for this. I knew that there would be some implications because of what I had done. And so I felt like I cheated myself out of enjoying a trifle that was an excellent trifle. So I did the only thing that you can truly do. I went back and got a second helping. And I remember being 18 is incredible because you can eat. Yeah, being 18 is incredible because you can eat whatever you want to eat and you never put on weight. At least I didn't. And I was able to go back and get a third helping and still not be satisfied. And I wasn't even hungry when this whole episode started. And when you look at a trifle and half of it's gone, you know you're in trouble. And when you know that you're in trouble, you might as well make it worthwhile. So I got the bowl, I sat in front of the telly, and I ate the whole thing. True story. True story. In one sitting over the course of a couple of hours, I consumed a whole trifle. And then I realized I was in trouble. And so I did the only thing that you can really do. I called my best friend and I said, hey, David, I'm in a little bit of trouble. Is there any way that I can come over and stay at your house tonight? And maybe tomorrow night too? He said, sure, come on over. Come on over. And I left the trifle by the sink empty bowl by the sink and the story I heard I don't wasn't there to experience it but the story that I heard is that Simon my mother and four of Simon's friends came home that afternoon and they found no trifle and no Douglas I ran I ran I got out of there as quick as I could and I ran and I found a nice place to hide Kind of reminds me of a story in Genesis chapter 3 of Adam and Eve, the fall, when they fell. They hid in the trees because they discovered that they were naked. But it's interesting, when they did something bad, that wasn't the end of the story. The story didn't end there. God didn't wander away and just leave them to their own devices. No, the story that I read in Genesis chapter 3 that God goes and looks for them, that God went and looked for them. In fact, it says that God was walking through, calling their names. I can imagine him, even though he knew exactly where they were, calling them, looking for them, finding them. And when he found them, he offered them and gave them a solution to sin. It's kind of interesting. I've got three children. When my children mess up, which I'm very pleased to say they don't do very often, but when they do, I always find them with a solution. Now, sometimes that solution is a wee bit painful for them, and even worse for me, of course. My parents used to say that. I don't know. But anyway, I say it too because that's what my parents said. But sometimes that solution is painful, but it's always filled with instruction, hope, and always with prayer. God found Adam and Eve hidden in the garden and gave them a solution. The first messianic promise in the Old Testament is found in Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when... God says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, talking about Christ, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I always picture this for some reason of me, a grown man, stepping on the head of a poisonous snake. The snake will bite me 
but with the aid of modern medicine, hopefully I will survive and I will be fine. If I step on the head of the snake, there are implications for me. I will suffer, but I will survive. But for the snake, the snake is crushed. With my weight, the head of the snake will be destroyed and the snake will die. But there's an implication. There's a cost. We all know that Christ didn't go to the cross with a song on his lips. Oh, I remember the many martyrs. I remember martyrs such as Polygarp on being burned at the stake and praising his Lord and Savior, praising God for the opportunity to participate in this witness, praising God for the opportunity to be faithful in front of his many followers and those he had converted, praising God for the opportunity to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. We remember the many martyrs who went to their deaths praising the Lord. But that wasn't Jesus' story. In the garden, it was past the cup. On the cross, it were those words that were so tragic. Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Painful words. Painful words that make me so sad. Christ suffered on the cross of Calvary. And he suffered because of the implications of our failings and our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us so very much. Because he loves us. That he came to this world, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross of Calvary, that his father was prepared to send him to this world in order to save us, that we might be with him forever. There's an interesting story that I always remember that every time I go home, we talk about and we tease each other about. This sounds a little, culturally, the English are a little bit differently. A different, okay? And there are things that we did that I found out are very un-American. I know this sounds strange, and maybe, maybe you'll understand it a wee bit if you're a little bit older. But we didn't have showers in my house when I was growing up. I think I said that yesterday. We had baths. And we didn't have swimming pools everywhere because of the climate. And so often bath time was play time. And I often bathed with my siblings. That sounds a little bit strange. But in England, it was just what happened. And I used to, when I was young, understand when I was young, when I was five or six, I used to bath, bathe with my sister, who was just a little bit older. And we would play. And I had ducks. I had battleships. I had submarines. And we would play in the bath and we would have a lot of fun. And my father, who is a very good mechanic and worked in a factory for years and can fix anything, was not a very good interior designer. At least his ideas weren't very good. And he decided, even though at that time he had three children, he decided that he would put wallpaper around the bathroom wall. Not a good idea. There were two rows of tiles that went up a little bit and then everything else was wallpaper and we would get those instructions that we just used to loathe my mother would say don't get the wallpaper wet please don't get the wallpaper wet it's beginning to peel in a couple of areas don't get the wallpaper well you've well, you got two kids in the bath what are you going to do we're going to splash each other we're going to play we're going to have a lot of fun the wallpaper is going to get wet and I think after a little while, we had grown sick and tired of hearing, don't get the wallpaper wet. So tired that I was playing and having fun, and I looked up, and I noticed that my sister was peeling the wet wallpaper off the wall. She would just go like this. 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 And I said, Natalie, because that's her name. I said, Natalie, what are you doing? And she said, Nothing. I said, Natalie, what are you doing? She said, nothing. I said, Natalie, why are you doing this? You're peeling the wallpaper off the wall. Mum will be very, very upset. But she didn't care. She just kept peeling. She sat there for the longest time 
Even though I begged her not to do so, she sat there peeling the wallpaper off the wall. And when she was finished and when we got the orders to get out the bath and put on our PJs and start getting ready for bed, we got up. The pair of us picked up all the wallpaper. We put it into the rubbish bin and we went off into our bedrooms to get ready for bed. And after a while, we went to bed. And we fell soundly asleep. At least I did. But I didn't sleep for long. Because my mother came into my room and said, Douglas, why did you peel the wallpaper off the wall? And I was like, Mom, I didn't. Don't lie to me, Douglas. If you lie to me, you'll get it twice as bad. Why did you do it? I said, I didn't. She said, well, who did? Now, this was interesting because we were told not to tattletale. So what do you say? And so I said the only words I could say, I, I don't know. <laughs> and so she went next door and I could tell that she woke my sister up in a far more gentle manner. And she said, Natalie, why did Douglas peel the wallpaper off the wall? <laughs> no, I was listening very attently. I was very interested in the conversation. Why did Douglas peel the wallpaper off the wall? And my sister said, he didn't. So she said, well, who did? And my sister said, I don't know. <laughs> and said, my mother did one of those things that I don't really understand. She took both of us downstairs into the kitchen. And she took out a wooden spoon that was sometimes used for stirring things, but more often used to discipline Douglas. And she put that wooden spoon on the side. And she said to me, and she said to my sister, I'm going to ask you one more time. And if you don't tell me who peeled the wallpaper off the wall, you're both going to get it. I didn't understand that. That sounded a little bit harsh. Why couldn't she say, and if you don't tell me who did it, I'll forgive you both. And you can go back to your rooms and you can just sleep. But she didn't say that. She said, if you don't tell me, you both get it. So she said, Douglas, did you peel the wallpaper off the wall? No. Who did? I don't know. Because I didn't. I didn't do it. And then she said, Natalie, did you peel the wallpaper off the wall? And Natalie said, I didn't. I said, who did? I don't know. Probably because she was scared. She didn't get the wooden spoon very often that I can remember. I knew the wooden spoon pretty well. And so at that moment, my mother turned around. She picked up the wooden spoon. And she turned to face us, and right as she was turning to face us, I can remember it clearly. I just heard those words, Mom, I did it. And she turned around, and she looked at me directly in the eye, and she said, I knew you did it from the start. Natalie, go back to your room. And me and the wooden spoon got better acquainted. Now, she didn't hit it hard because I was young. It was just a little tang and a little sting a few times, enough times to remind you not to peel the wallpaper off the wall again. But she gave me a little spanking with that wooden spoon like we got or like I got many, many times. And then I went off and I went back to my room and I laid in bed and I started to cry. And after a few minutes, the door opened again. Oh, no, what else have I done? What else has she found out? But it wasn't. It was my older sister, Natalie. And she came in, and she was crying too. And she got in bed with me, and we were both crying, and we were both cuddling, and we were both saying things like, Mommy's mean. Yeah, we got a bad mommy. Mommy's not nice. And we lay there crying and hugging for a little while until we both fell asleep. And the morning came, and the pain was completely over, and we went about our day. We kept that a secret. We kept that a secret for years. In fact, I remember going home in 1993 and we were joking and we were horsing around and we were both in our late 20s and we were joking and my sister turned around and told my mum that it was her that peeled the wallpaper off the wall. And my mum didn't believe it. My mum absolutely didn't believe it. I don't know what it's like when a parent finds out that they gave a beating to the wrong kid, because I've never done that. But <laughs> I've never made that mistake. But my mother was just horrified and couldn't believe that she had given me a beating with the wooden spoon, and I wasn't guilty. 
And she just sat there, and I remember the conversation. She said, you're lying to me. I said, no, we're not lying. It was, it, it was, it was Natalie. Natalie was saying, it was me. It was me that did that. She said, you're lying. No, no, it was Natalie that did it. I said, are you kidding? No, it was Natalie that did it. You let him take a beating? And Natalie said, oh, I was scared. You took a beating for her? Why did you take a beating for her? And I tell you the truth as I've often told it. I loved and love my sister so much, so very much, that I was happy. Well, not happy. <laughs> but I was prepared to take a beating for her. Now, I've got five brothers, and I would never take a beating for any one of those scallywags. <laughs> I guarantee you, I wouldn't take a beating for them. But for my sister, there is something so very special about my sister that I was prepared to take a beating for her. There is so much very special about you that Jesus on the cross of Calvary took a beating for you, was humiliated for you, died on that cross, that spiteful cross, so that you could spend eternity with Jesus Christ and your loved ones in heaven. You know, when I talk to young people, there is so much in the world that makes young people feel inadequate, that they don't measure up, that they stumble, that they fall, and they struggle. And Satan makes them feel like they need to run, that they need to hide, that they need to hide from God, that they've blown it. Whatever they're involved in now, whatever they've done, it's too much. But then I think of that cross that Jesus died on. I think of the love of God. I think of the reason Jesus came into this world. And so when I work with my own children, I tell them, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing that can separate you from the love of God. As long as you have air in your lungs, you can always point to the cross and experience forgiveness. And we see this in the story of the thief on the cross. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. That guy didn't steal a bag of chips from 7-Eleven. Robbers in those days were violent. They were murderous. They were evil. And that man on the cross of Calvary recognized his sinfulness, recognized that he was up there for good reason, and this man had done nothing. And so he reached out and he said, remember, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus gave him salvation right there. Right there was that gift. And why? Because no matter how sinful that man was, God loved him. And Jesus loves him too. We are told in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever, an open invitation to all, the whole world, that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is why it is so important, no matter what, that you never run from God, that you come to him each and every morning, each and every night, and say, Lord, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross of Calvary. He who knew no sin, became sin for us so that we could live. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you so much for your love. We don't understand it so many times, but we thank you so much for this truth that we are loved. And so great is your love for us that you gave us Jesus. So great is your love for us that you gave us Jesus who lived and died on the cross so that we could be with you forever. 
May each one of us accept this gift. May this gift change us. May this gift motivate us to leave this place and to go out into this world to share your truth. There are so many people in this world who have such an ugly or different or confused picture of you. The greatest picture of you is your son, Jesus. And we thank you so much for his ministry to the thief on the cross when he was dying himself. May we be motivated to share this message with word, with deed. And bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.